Excellent. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the University of Oxford's Rothermere American Institute for the latest installment of our Future of American Politics series. My name is Mitch Robertson. I'm a fellow here at the RAI, and I'm the convener of this series. Uh, following on from our previous and very lively conversation a fortnight ago, I'm very excited for this evening's discussion about the future of the Democratic Party. In many ways, the future of the Democratic Party looks brighter than the future of the Republican Party. A rare defeat of an incumbent president, victories in traditionally Republican states, and the clean sweep of the Georgia runoffs. But perhaps that is not the whole story. For this discussion, the REI is delighted to welcome two very distinguished scholars of American political parties. Our first guest is Associate Professor Julia Azari, Assistant Chair in the Department of Political Science at Marquette University. She's an expert in American political development and the role played by the parties in American politics. She is most recently the author of Delivering the People's Message, The Changing Politics of the Presidential Mandate. And our second guest is Professor Seth Maskett, Professor of Political Science and Director of the Center for American Politics at the University of Denver. His research has been published in the American Journal of Political Science and the Journal of Politics. Uh, he's most, recent, most recently the author of Learning from Loss, The Democrats 2016 to 2020, which was published late last year by the Cambridge University Press. Um, in addition to this scholarly work, uh, both Seth and Julie are highly adept at distilling their research for broader audiences. They've both written extensively for 538 and the Washington Post and the New York Times, as well as for the Mischiefs of Faction. I've got to get that right. Mischiefs of Faction <laughs> political science blog, which I would greatly recommend to anyone out there. And as well, both of their Twitter feeds. They're both uh, very lively and informative on Twitter. So I'd recommend giving them, giving them both a follow. Um, so the structure of this evening's event, um, we'll start with some, some questions to both of our guests, um, but we welcome all, get all questions from our, from our audience, so please use the, the Q&A function and we'll, we'll uh, try and get to as many of those, as many of those to our panel as we can, bearing in mind the, the hour limit. Um, so just say thank you everyone for coming and thank you very much to both of our guests. Um, Julie, if I can start with you, just how well did the Democratic Party do in the 2020 election, do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I, I feel like you'll get, if you ask a bunch of scholars of American politics, you'll get a bunch of different answers. I think that it's, so it's important to keep a couple of contextual factors in mind. And and I'll maybe I'll get to like a definitive one sentence answer, but maybe not. Um, I think there's, there's two important factors. One is um, the expectations for what would happen in Congress where the Democrats really dramatically underperformed, particularly in the House of Representatives. And it may be that may be a ref reflection of the expectations and not of, of the Democrats' performance, but I do think it bears in mind they, they lost House seats and they underperformed in terms of the Senate seats they were expected to pick up, particularly with uh, Republican incumbents in, in Maine and North Carolina who looked vulnerable and then, but nevertheless maintained their seats. The other, the other piece of, um, of context that I think is really important though is the incumbency factor and just how rare it has become in American politics for an incumbent president to lose. Um, so this was, I mean, so I'm teaching the American presidency right now, and this is the first time that my students have ever seen that happen. Um, the, um, you know, so I think that that's, that's really critical. It's not super surprising that Trump was the president who broke that nearly 30 year pattern of two term um, of two, two, two term presidents. He was pretty unpopular throughout his term, even before things took a turn um, in 2020. <laughs> and um, he had won kind of accidentally, you might say in 2016 through the electoral college and not through the popular vote. So it's, again, not super surprising, but it is unusual um, for, that, for that to happen. And so I think that that does speak to some, some deliberate mobilization and some ways that Democrats took a hard look at the at the electoral college map of 2016 and the losses there, as well as actually learning to, to kind of riff on Seth's book title, right? Learning from victory. I think there were actually some things they learned in from their 2018 race about the political geography of their coalition and about different kinds of appeals that went into Biden's victory, as well as to um, some, of the, some of the Senate victories they were able to pull off, maybe most notably in, in Georgia. So it's, I think the answer to that is kind of, middle of the road. It was kind of middle of the road victory. Um, but that's also, I'll say as someone who's written on 
election interpretation and mandates, that's not that uncommon for the actual facts on the ground to be very mixed. And then for the, the narrative to try to kind of smooth that over. Excellent, thank you very much for that. Uh, Seth? Yeah, um, I think like Julia, my impression of this is based a lot on what we think Democrats should have done. And, you know, this is there's remarkably little agreement on just, you know, what, you know, what our baseline expectations should have been uh, before that election. I, I think, you know, most people were just going on polls, you know, that and that makes perfect sense. Um, and, uh, you know, as we know, the, the Democrats somewhat underperformed the polls. Um, you know, Biden won, but he didn't do quite as well as a lot of polls were expecting. And Democrats uh, lost a number of seats in the House when they were expected to pick up some. Um, and they also lost a number of state legislatures when they were expected to pick up some. Um, now, does that mean Democrats did a bad job or does it just mean the pollsters did a bad job? Um, you know, basically, like the, the polling was off in roughly the same direction and the same degree that it was off in 2016. Um, and, you know, not in any catastrophic way, but just uh, the when basically when Donald Trump is running for president, polling seems to undercount uh, the number of um, the number of conservatives, the number of Republicans who will show up to vote that year. Um, the polls were very accurate in 2018 when he was not at the top of the ballot. But in 2016, and 2020, there were people who showed up who pollsters basically didn't expect to show up. Um, so, you know, in, in that sense, okay, yeah, they, you know, Democrats did okay. Um, one of the interesting things, is, and uh, I, I'm still not sure the right way to conceptualize this, is that if you compare the presidential level results with the congressional results, um, either Trump ran behind his party or Biden ran ahead of his party. Um, and, and you can think about it in both ways. I mean, if you... Um, uh, when I try to think about what a you know baseline expectation for an election should be, I I try to look at the economy. Mm -hmm. That tends to be the most reliable predictor of how the incumbent party is going to do. Um, if you can figure out what the economy was in 2020, you're a better scholar than I am because that, that thing was all over the place. It had you know it had a massive dip when the coronavirus first hit, and then it had a massive resurgence. And so whether it was a good or bad year is really hard to say. Um, but, you know, in the lead up to the November election, the economy had recovered a good deal. People had, you know, they had made back some of their lost, uh, lost income. Some jobs were reopening. Um, so in theory, okay, maybe that's a situation in which the incumbent party will do okay. And that's roughly what happened with Republicans across the board, with the exception of the presidency. And, you know, in which case, uh, Donald Trump ran a little bit behind. He's a somewhat, and I think we saw this in 2016 as well, he's a slight underperformer. Mm -hmm. That is, um, he turns some people out to vote who might not otherwise vote, but he also turns some people off who he doesn't need to. He makes enemies he doesn't need to make. Um, he picks fights the presidents don't need to, um, to pick. And that cost him somewhat on the margins. And so there were people who uh, you know, I think there were longstanding Republicans who simply felt they could not vote for him a second time. Um, but we're nonetheless happy to vote Republican uh, all down the rest of the ballot. And I, you know, I think that accounts for a lot of the, a lot of the disparity there. Can I actually add something quick here about expectations? I think we don't really know anything definitive about what shapes expectations. I think Seth is right about the role of the polls in 2020. But I think polarization actually exacerbates the, the difference between expectations and performance in two ways. And I think one is that the kind of affective and social polarization we have make it harder for partisans to believe anybody could vote for the other person, for the other candidate. Well, at the same time, I think polarization kind of pushes against um, the current of the economic predictors of voting that Seth was just talking about. That's It makes candidates slightly more robust, like an incumbent slightly more robust to an economic downturn because their partisans are less likely to defect. So it actually has, I think 10 years from now, we're gonna see a potentially a much greater divergence between expectations and performance for that reason. Excellent, that's fascinating, thank you. And just sticking with the with the 2020 election, perhaps come to you, Julie, to begin with, what, what do we know about what the issues were that, that motivated Democrats? What, did, what issues did they do well on? you think that attracted Democratic voters? What issues? That's, I mean, that's an interesting question. I think we're still kind of figuring out what that, what that mm -hmm. meant. So on the one hand, 
the Biden agenda and the democratic issue stances in general tend to be slightly, slightly popular, um, more consistently more popular than Republican ones. This isn't super new. Um, I think Democrats have an edge when, when economic and kind of social welfare issues are, um, are at the forefront, but also it's not totally clear to me how much this election was about kind of core issues and how much it was a, simply a referendum on Trump. And I think Seth has done some recent work on Trump and COVID. So I might let him talk more specifically about how those things interact. Yeah, uh, thanks, Julia. Um, so, uh, I mean, when a president is running for re-election, you know, very often the election is about that president's performance or, you know, just how, how people perceive that performance. Um, and my impression, and I, I've written a little bit about this at 538, uh, was that, uh, you know, COVID on balance hurt him. Um, not as much as I might have anticipated, really, and I think as much as a lot of an people anticipated. I mean, he was basically coming off three years of pretty respectable economic growth, of no real major military conflicts abroad. You know, those are all roughly circumstances in which presidents usually win re-election and are relatively popular. Um, and then suddenly to go from that to um, a massive pandemic, massive recession within a couple of weeks, um, you know, my, I think my expectation about at that at the time is that, wow, the political fundamentals have changed dramatically. This is going to really hurt him. And it moved the polls slightly against him. It maybe hurt him like three or four percentage points. Now, you know, as Julia points out, we're in this very polarized era. Um, maybe that's all we should really be expecting things to move since people are so really, you know, deeply committed to their party. Um, and I think also related to that was how quickly uh, the pandemic became a, um, a partisan polarized issue in U.S. politics. Um, and I think Trump really uh, uh, intentionally made it that way, that he, um, you know, it was, there were a number of, there were experts, there were congressional leaders who were saying one thing, and he immediately challenged them and said, no, I'm going to push back. I don't think we need masks. Uh, I'm not going, you know, I'm not going to take this as seriously as you are. And that immediately became you know, the de facto Republican position on a lot of things. And so just going forward, people just processed the pandemic through a through a very partisan lens. Um, and so if it, you know, I mean, on balance, his approval ratings on COVID went down over the course of the year. And I think that that hurt him on balance. But uh, to a remarkable degree, um, Republicans went on believing that he was doing a very good job and Democrats from a very early on believed he was doing a poor job and, and very little shifted that over the course of time. I'm, gonna, can I, I'm just being really unruly, but I, I want to take the, the, uh, the floor because I, I needed a second to think out a couple of, of not sort of less bread and butter issues and what I think, what I'm guessing people are curious about and what my take is on that. And what is the kind of racial unrest that we had in 2020 here and the, the topic of, of race um, and of you know what to do with with police forces and also the kind of questions on the environment and Green New Deal. So I think those the structure of the Democrats challenge on those issues is similar. And I also want to point out for non US folks that the kind of national level debate about defund the police is kind of is kind of awkward here because actually those are very much controlled at the local level. Um, in the United States, nevertheless, it's obviously it's a national conversation. And so I think the Democrats have a, have a really critical kind of strange challenge here on those issues, because on the issue of kind of racial justice and racism and on the issue of climate change, the, the kind of very shallow consensus of national public opinion is, shifts in the Democrats' direction. That, that people are more sympathetic to democratic positions on those issues than Republican ones. But then that, that doesn't go very deep and it doesn't really tell you what to do. And so it leaves the Democrats with a really deep fissure within their, their coalition on both of those issues about how, how hard to go. Um, I don't really like to use the word extreme, but I think it might apply here. Kind of what, how extreme or how deep or how disruptive should the action be to to address those issues. And that the Democrats are not unified on that at all. And there are very real 
policy and interest differences within the democratic coalition. So they kind of have this, this advantage in the broader scope and then this disadvantage when it comes to figuring out how to move forward. Um, and that that's that does offer Republicans a kind of way of, you know, they have an entree to take advantage of that, even though their own issue positions on those those two questions are less popular than the democratic stances. So that's that's I think kind of how I would think about those issues. Seth, would you agree with that? Did you want to say anything? Yeah, I don't have any yeah, major disagreements there. I think um, it is interesting to think about uh, the, you know, some of the the unrest over the particularly over last summer, um, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I, I think at the time there was an expectation that was going to have a pretty, you know, that would end up being a pretty substantial effect on the presidential election. I don't know that it ultimately did. That is, I, you know, I think like, like COVID, it was also a very partisan response to that. Um, but I think it did, uh, in some ways, I think it, it, it put more, it, it probably changed the Democratic coalition somewhat. Um, it put greater expectations on the Biden administration uh, to, and, and the Democratic Party more generally to directly address issues of racial injustice. Um, notably, you know, when, you know, Biden came into office, his, uh, his inaugural address, um, he identified sort of four crises that he was trying to deal with, you know, what the, the economy, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, climate change, and uh, white supremacy, racial injustice. Um, and, you know, he, so he came in identifying that as one of the things he really needs to deal with in his first term in office. And, I'm not sure that would have been the case had it not been for um, for the unrest last summer, for the massive, you know, the, the very widespread protests that have happened. Um, and I think that also caused a lot of policy change in a lot of state houses as well, um, even if it didn't necessarily tip, you know, the presidential election in one way or the other. Excellent. Thank you. And um, we might come back to that when we get into the actual actual governing. But in terms of just curious about the um, the electorate, uh, you mentioned Seth as, as well earlier. Um, formerly Republican voters who perhaps voted for Biden this time. What do you think the prospects are of them? Will they go back to the Republican Party, do you think, in 2022, 2024? Is there, is there an opportunity for the Democratic Party to sort of grab these as Democratic voters going forward? I mean, one of the patterns we're seeing is just a remarkable resiliency of, of partisanship. Um, I think, you know, Trump probably pushed the outer edges of that and actually lost some voters that uh, he, you know, that, that, that most other presidential nominees would not have lost. Um, I don't know that they're necessarily lost for the Republican Party in the long run. Um, I think if he, and we still don't know the answer to this, but if he's not the nominee in 2024, um, I, I think there's a, and you have it say a more, a more typical nominee, someone who's, you know, a longstanding Senator or governor or something like that. Um, I think there's a very good chance that a lot of those voters return to the fold. Um, one area where there has been some interesting shifting, um, has to do basically with, um, education levels. And this has been going on. We see this in some, at some state level results, in addition to uh, opinion polls, where sort of, um, uh, basically white uh, working class, so defined, or, you know, white people without college educations have been trending more Republican in recent years. That's been a pattern we've seen in Southern states for a long time, but a number of Northern states, particularly in the Midwest, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, and, and areas around that um, have been trending more in the Republican direction. While, um, uh, others with college education, um, even those you know making a fair amount of money, have been trending a little more toward the Democratic Party in recent years. So the, there is a little bit of shifting uh, in there at the at, at that level. It's hard to that that predates Trump to some extent, although Trump really accelerated that. Maybe things return to a little more traditional patterns with him no longer running, but I don't know that we're in a world with him no longer running just yet. You there? Yeah, I mean, I think this is without. Without delving too much into the Republicans, we're supposed to talk about the Democrats, but I think that is kind of what I'm going to do. Yeah. Um, so I think that there's in the within the Republican coalition, there's long been this sort of fissure between the base and the party's elite, and that includes elected officials and also increasingly increasingly sort of like their media apparatus. And it is the most stunning group of defectors to me has actually been this sort of middle of the middle of the spectrum 
Republican media apparatus, right? You get the defection of people like like Bill Kristol. Um, and those folks, I think, are not coming back. And for a variety of reasons, but I don't think it's strictly about Trump or it's even strictly about like the sort of Trump agenda. I think that within that group of people, you have actual shifts with where they lie and in, with respect to the kind of broader issue terrain. But we're also seeing on the Republican side is the, um, is the replacement, right, of that elite class of people who, who have defected. So you have a new media establishment that is very Trumpy in its orientation, and you have this kind of rise of Trump Congress people, rise of Trump um, kind of I, I use I use the word like Trumpy, Trumpist, Trumpian. I don't know. Um, I, I need we need to like agree on a word, but um, Trump style legislators at the subnational level too. Like his his political style has deeply permeated the party. Um, at the same time, I mean, Seth is right that partisanship has been really has been really stable, and that Trump was like a really hard test of that. On the other hand, we are actually seeing the kind of number of, of people who identify as Republican in the electorate fall, and that um, the kind of national impression of the Republican Party has also declined. So I do think that you're seeing this is not a great time. I think to be an establishment. Republican leader, you see that in Mitch McConnell's kind of vacillation in relation to where he's he's at with Trump. The trick here is that the whole question around the Republican Party, the whole question has become about Trump. And now, as, as Seth pointed out, we don't know what Trump's future in the party is. And so that's, I'm not really answering your question about who is gettable for, um, for Democrats. I think that's situational. I think that's situational. And I think that it kind of depends on on who in who in the Republican coalition is really listening to those Trumpist elites. And that I, I think that's sort of the fulcrum. And I have thoughts about what may or may not happen to the Republicans in 2024, but we can return to that. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. And um, we've had a question in from, from Dan, Dan Rowe here at the RAI. And Thank you everyone for your questions. Please keep them coming. Um, about polarization, is it possible to close Pandora's box when it comes to polarization? <laughs> or as he asks, is the median voter dead? Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so I'll say, well, the median voter is not dead. Um, that, you know, the, the fact that uh, the, between 2016 and 2020, um, you know, there were, there was some impact of outside events. There was some impact of, of you know, possibly of campaigning and, and, and some other things, you know, suggesting it's not 100% a polarized electorate. There still are people who will move back and forth depending on conditions or, um, or the things that the president says and things like that. Um, that said, it's really polarized era. Um, and uh, um, let's see, Liliana Mason's uh, book from 2018 um, on this uh, uncivil agreement, I think is a um, really does a nice job of getting into, you know, how this era is different from previous eras. Partisanship is nothing new in the United States. Um, but the fact that partisanship overlaps with so many other different divisions, that it overlaps with liberal conservative ideology, which it didn't always, that it overlaps with race and with gender, um, and to some extent with class, and uh, to some extent with just simply where people live, whether they live in cities or suburbs or exurbs, and just so many ways that we identify ourselves also fall into the party divide. And that just makes it very hard to break. Um, you know, I think we'll we'll continue to see some some shifts here and there on you know things like education and um, and other areas, but it's it's really hard to shatter. And you know, one of the things I was really surprised by again, we're I'm focusing too much on Republicans, um, but that you know, 2016 seemed to be a year when things might shatter. You had two historically uh, unpopular presidential nominees. Um, and, you know, in, in particular, you had, I think, a very fractured Republican Party where you had, um, you know, a lot of party activist voters who were saying they wanted Donald Trump and a lot of party leaders who were saying they did not, um, but couldn't agree on what they did want. Um, you know, those are kind of conditions where you might see a party split. You know, you might see, you know, ample support for a third party, at least temporarily. Um, and it didn't happen. Um, ultimately, party leaders decide, OK, let's just go with what 
our voters wanted and they stuck with it and they still to a large extent are um so i don't see this shattering just yet and i have a hard time envisioning exactly what would shatter it at this point julia yeah so i think i want to um poke at the premise of the question a little bit about depolarization and here i also i'll also cite more more recent statements and and uh work by by liliana mason where she's talked about how depolarization isn't really the goal democratization is the goal um and so that's where unfortunately here in the us we've really seen i think some some pretty significant challenges in that regard and some pretty deep challenges to fundamental democratic small d democratic values of you know accepting the the results of an election accepting procedures accepting all votes as being valid um and kind of accepting the legitimacy of the opposition and that's where i think you know some polarization is pretty symmetrical but this is this is not and there, there's a wonderful piece i would also recommend for, by another 538 writer Perry Bacon, where he really breaks down kind of like, here are things that Republicans, particularly at the state level, so it's about Republicans at the state level, are doing to try and disenfranchise Democratic constituencies. Democrats are not doing those things, right? They might sometimes make unfortunate statements about white Christian evangelicals or whatever, but they don't, they're not trying to disenfranchise them. Um, and so I think that's really important as we think about depolarization is that there's, there's some greater stuff at stake here. And this is related to other times in, in American history where we've managed to, to depolarize in some way. And one of the really notable times is essentially the Democratic Party vanquishing the Republicans in the context of the Great Depression in the 1930s. And so most people think about that as as a kind of creation of a broad consensus around a set of political economic ideas and values. But the other thing that, that doesn't get brought up as much in the conversation about the New Deal is that the, the other element of that was pushing race out of the agenda and keeping it off the agenda for another 30 years. And so it's really important to be careful in American politics when we think about the median voter and we think about depolarization that moving forward that whatever consensus comes about or, or might kind of depolarize the electorate that it doesn't throw people of color under the bus which essentially is what a lot of new deal democrats decided to do was to accept compromises that that literally excluded african americans from some of the benefits of that legislation so i, I just I, it's a wonderful question that the that this audience member poses, but I do want us to really kind of think about what's what lies under the polarization idea. I like how you out Lily Mason and me. That was really cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I heard her on a podcast last week and she was saying, yeah, okay. <laughs> I like how we're getting a reading list as well. So I was like, okay, yeah. I'm yeah. 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 Work for everyone in the audience. Um, now I just was wanted to turn to quickly to, to party organization. Um, so the Democratic National Committee something I know both of you have written on and, and thought about uh, quite a lot. Recently, Jamie Harrison being appointed as the chair. I uh, just wanted to ask both of you, what do you think the main issues are facing this body? What do you think its, its role should be in the Democratic Party going forward over the next two, four, four years? Um, perhaps uh, Julia. Then. Sure. I mean, I think, and this is something, I think Seth has written about this. We've, as you said, both written about the DNC and about party structure is like, people have this sense of the DNC is this really powerful like <laughs> entity that has, that has a role in con congressional procedure and all sorts of things. And it just doesn't, um, you know, it kind of organizes the convention and the nomination process. And more recently, which Seth and I have written about some together is the, the debates. Um, I think that the DNC's biggest problem is kind of in establishing internal legitimacy and overcoming this PR problem, where it's seen as like, since I've said what it's not, right, and what critiques are not fair. Let me say what critiques I think are a little fair of party politics in the US in general, and maybe the DNC in particular, which is that it's it's very establishment in a way that it's, its core supporters are not entirely. Um, that it's kind of it's kind of staid and institutional and and predictable, and I do think that I mean Harrison is an interesting is an interesting pick um, as someone who's a very kind of talented um, 
rise or through the, the party ranks in South Carolina um, and not a former elected official and also not a kind of media personality. Um, he's not extremely online. He's not extremely on the Sunday shows. And so I, I'll be interested to see if he can sort of revamp it. I think in general, the Democrats, people talk about the Democrats being, you know, as I've said, kind of state and institutionally conservative, which I've written about um, and out of touch with their, their coalition. But I also think the Democrats have a very difficult balance there's there's two problems there and and one is that they need to have a pretty substantial geographical advantage in their reach to to compete on par with republicans republicans have a built-in advantage because of the rural urban divide and the way our system is designed so so they really have to think in terms of the big coalitional picture um and they also have a really complicated coalition where you have younger you know younger and older voters with different economic perspectives you have a very racially diverse coalition you have you have a substantial number of people who are close to kind of the biden wing this is why biden won the nomination i think um, <laughs> because a lot of people are closer to those kinds of economic positions but you also have a substantial minority that are in the the, the bernie warren wing and that's and those two things are not always compatible you have um I think a, an interesting nexus of economic issues, race issues, and moderation. And that's a really complicated thing for Democrats to kind of keep together and then maintain that, that kind of outsized coalition to be competitive. So that's what I see as being Harrison's big, big problem going forward is doing that and then making it look kind of hip and lively and responsive at the same time. So, you know, in some ways, this comes back to your your first question about, you know, did how did the Democrats do in, in last year's election? Um, and, you know, what was one of the most interesting things uh, right after Election Day this this last uh, November uh, was that Democrats had won, but they mostly seemed to be acting like they'd lost. They, they thought they should have done better and they were immediately trying to they were immediately fighting with each other about what had happened, why they underperformed. You had sort of you know some moderate white Democrats saying it was because of uh, all the the defund the police messages and the socialism messages, and then you had you know people like AOC pushing back and like it's because you moderates ran terrible campaigns and you didn't put the money in the right places, um, and those are all fair. Um, but you know one of the things I was doing in in my recent book, uh, I had followed a lot of conversations among DNC members, basically between 2016 and 2020. Um, and they fought a lot with each other about, you know, different interpretations about why they had lost the presidential race in 2016. And you had sort of this Bernie Sanders wing that said that, you know, part of the problem was we had this kind of illegitimate system for picking presidential nominees. We had, you know, there was this perception that uh, that the DNC was too aggressively picking sides and they needed to step out of it. And you had other people in the DNC are like, we don't even, we wish we had that kind of power. We don't remotely have that kind of power. Um, but they were also sensitive to concerns that they that they appeared that way. Um, they tried to make some systems more open. At the same time, you know, they, so they they loosened some things up at the um, for the primary and caucus contests. They also did a totally, uh, you know, a, a really obscure method for um, picking who got to participate in debates and who didn't. Um, and, you know, so they sort of moved in, you know, both openness and uh, non-transparency at the same time. Um, and I think they're still trying to interpret what's the best way going forward from here. Like one of the few areas where we've actually seen uh, some DNC members starting to get into fights this year is about basically what role Iowa and New Hampshire should play um, in the next cycle. And like, you know, as you know, we've, over the last 50 years or so, we've developed this very weird system for nominating presidential candidates. And uh, Iowa, New, I, the Iowa caucuses in the New Hampshire primary are just historically the first, not because they have to be, they just are. And uh, they uh, got a lot of, uh, you know, I, I think they were getting some real pushback within the Democratic coalition over this last cycle, for one thing, just being really unrepresentative states. Um, they're they're very white, they're very rural, and aren't necessarily reflective of what the Democratic Party looks like right now. And so there were a lot of people just saying very early on, should we really, you know, defer to them 
um, in, you know, should, should they have such an outsized voice in, in picking presidential nominees? Um, and as it turned out, they kind of didn't. Uh, you know, the, the ultimate presidential nominee came in like fourth and fifth place in those two states. Um, and also, Iowa had a number of other problems. They weren't able to count their results for like a week. Um, there, there were a lot of things that went wrong. So, you know, I've, I've, we're already seeing some pushback, people saying, well, maybe we should take Iowa out of the rotation and move it later in the contest. And other people like, look, Iowa didn't get to pick the winner anyway, but people know how to campaign there. So maybe that's not the worst thing in the world. Um, but I think that's that's going to be part of the discussion. Now, there's a decent chance that uh, there isn't much of a contest on the presidential side for the Democrats in 2024. Joe Biden just, you know, runs again and is the nominee. And so Democrats don't worry about this so much. And this is more of a Republican concern. Um, but it, it, it might be a concern. And that's, that could be where we see some of the first shots fired for uh, within the DNC going forward. Do you want to add anything to that? Or perhaps what state do you think could be better served as, <laughs> as being off the contest? Oh, dear. Yeah, um, Wisconsin. Yeah. Um, which is probably, <laughs> no, well, I'm, I'm like, I'm sort of kidding, but I'm sort of not because it, Wisconsin's a lot like Iowa, except it's in relatively cheap media markets and that kind of thing, except it has some more diversity, including the city I'm talking to you from, which is majority minority. Um, there's, I was reading, this is just like a really fun book. And now I can't remember the author's name, but it's, it's called Chasing Hillary. And it's just like her following Hillary Clinton on the campaign trail. And the amount of time there in Iowa is just absurd. Um, so I've been a really vocal critic of, of this of this aspect of the system. Um, I, I would the only thing I would add now that I've babbled extensively about nothing is um, <laughs> that the um, that I think that one of the kind of deeper challenges for the Democratic Party and maybe for, I mean, probably for both parties as they think about their nomination process is to really think about the, the balance of formal versus informal elements of the process. And I think that really takes us far afield of the, the same stupid questions that we ask every time, which is like, what should be the right balance between party leaders and voters? And it's like, those two groups are mutually informative and that question is never gonna have an answer that satisfies anyone. Um, and we ask a lot about that. And we ask a lot about like, what kind of nominee will the process produce, which I also think is not the right question. Um, because it, uh, you know, clever nominees will will read the system, right? Clever hopefuls will read the system and figure out how to manipulate it. And you just can't predict all of the contingencies and, you know, what will happen. But I do think that it's worth thinking about kind of what are what are informal expectations and what are the actual written formal rules of the process? What are the implications of that for how transparent people think the process is and for where people can use power without, you know, without going to those, those official more transparent channels? So that's, you know, I think our front loading process and the expectation that the nominee will be chosen well advanced of the convention and that a convention you know, a contested convention would be a disaster for a party. I think those are things that need to be re-examined really deeply. And I don't know if this actually answers the question you were asking before, but that is, but that is what I think. Yeah. <laughs> Seth, do you want to make the case for Colorado? I got, I got to do like the chance. <laughs> Colorado would well, be good I'm, too. Yeah, Colorado would be fun, and we, and unlike Wisconsin, we have much more pleasant winters. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, one thing I would say is uh, what one proposal I've seen is to basically have like to have like four states, but not the same four states, you know, and just, you know, have a representation of like different regions of the country, have a, a very rural, a very urban, a, you know, a southern, a western, a northern. Um, and you could just choose which states from each of those categories and basically they all have contests, at, you know, on this on the same day. There are a lot of ways. There are a lot of proposals out there for doing things differently. Than we've been doing them and you know what's what's sort of stunning is the the resilience of the system we have but you know anytime someone proposes a change um you know they immediately you know someone will run to iowa and say well well we're not going to ever give up our first in the nation status and then that person wins iowa um and 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 you know and so that uh th th there's a lot of resistance and i you know for for good reason but yeah i i think we're pretty we're pretty due for some sort of shifting along these lines <laughs>
We also have amazing state fairs in Wisconsin. I would just like to add. So how's your skiing? Um, there's one. There's one man-made ski hill. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know. Thank you. Um, now, if we can turn to turn to governing, perhaps, and, pro and prospects prospects for governing in in, the, in this last last third. Um, how difficult do you think it will be for the Democratic Party to hold their coalition together? And perhaps, what are some some areas that it might be easier to, and what are some areas that it's going to be very difficult for them to do? Uh, Pat Seth, I start with you. Yeah. So, you know, one thing following last year. Um, it was interesting watching sort of the more progressive wing of the Democratic Party, the, you know, the Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, AOC types, um, who were for the most part, like, they didn't really get the presidential nominee they wanted. Um, but they were also on very good behavior throughout 2020. That is, you know, they reckon they sort of looked back at 2016, they saw risks in splitting the party, and they decided they were going to simply go all in on, you know, advocating for Joe Biden. Um, for not making the party look very split. Um, and now they're in a position where the Democratic Party has, you know, for the first time in a while, unified control mm -hmm. by very, very narrow margins, you know, narrow control in the House and, you know, a 50-50 Senate. You know, I mean, it couldn't be more narrow control for Democrats. And it's probably a very unstable majority as it is, um, which again, puts progressives in a bad position. Like they, they want things now, you know, they feel like, you know, we've been good players. We are due certain things in terms of policy on, on environment, on racial justice, on, uh, on political reform, on a number of areas. They also fully recognize that, uh, you know, the Senate is a reality and they are in many ways at the mercy of the most conservative democratic Senator, uh, Joe Manchin of West Virginia, who's like, He's kind of an interesting case, like, you know, the fact that he can get consistently elected in a very Republican state like West Virginia is to his credit. And the, you know, the Democrats really rely on him a lot for that. Um, but also his response is he picks and chooses which issues to, you know, to back up his party on and which he needs to sort of signal that he's different from his national party. And, and he'll occasionally, you know, sink his party as a result of that. Um, so, you know, they're those divisions within the Democratic Party are real. The sort of, you know, the, the, the Biden wing versus the, the Sanders wing, the, you know, those are real distinctions and people have very different views about exactly how government should be run and, and you know, what, what healthcare should look like in the United States and what environmental reform and other things. Um, but I, you know, I think progressives realize just what, uh, you know, just how many limits there are um, on their governing position right now. I think many of them will be, you know, pushing to, move the Democratic Party somewhat further left in next year's midterm elections. They're, they're probably going to be challenging some more conservative Democrats in primaries. But, you know, the odds of Democrats coming out of that with larger majorities um, and more progressive majorities, I, I think, are pretty slim. Yeah, so I think that the there's a you know, I'm thinking about this in terms of Congress and president kind of questions. And one possibility that I see is that I think a lot of commentators also see is a much more presidentially centered governance moving forward. And that that's not, that's not really ideal from a kind of coalition perspective. And that sort of, I mean, this relates to what we were talking about before about the nomination process, because essentially what that does is it sort of relegates all of these party into the nomination process as opposed to actually happening at the governing stage between different factions of Congress um, and uh, factions in Congress rather. And I see that that's, that's likely to, to maybe happen where on the one hand, you have a couple of kind of core economic issues that you can sell like a major COVID relief plan. Um, and maybe, maybe like something along the lines of an expansion of of the Affordable Care Act or some kind of jobs bill. Those are things I think you can build a large coalition for. Um, I mean, to, to speak to Seth brought up Joe Manchin, right? West Virginia has a very long history of culturally conservative Democrats. It's It was actually a very reliable democratic state up till like 2004. Um, but not because not because it was a sort of AOC place, right? But it is a very poor place that really needs a lot of help. and. I think that's something that you know you can build a larger coalition for that kind of thing. 
Um, and those things could possibly come out of Congress. Then you have the kind of Biden, you know, structural racism agenda, which was never going to come out of Congress. That's going to be a combination of kind of symbolic leadership, mm -hmm. with the, which the presidency is, is poised to do, and then local level implementation of different types of reforms. So that's, I mean, I'm not sure what that will actually look like, but Biden is in kind of a good position to, to continue to articulate those priorities. Um, and then you'll see stuff happen piecemeal out of the White House, which is exactly what you saw in the Trump administration and exactly what you saw in the Obama administration and to some degree even going, um, going further back than that. And so like we've already seen Biden use a lot of executive action to undo some of the stuff in the Trump administration, but where I think you'll continue to see a kind of tension in the Democratic coalition too is in, in the question of immigration, where again, this is another area where the direction of policy, the Democrats are more popular. When it comes to the, the nitty gritty of implementation, there's a lot of disagreement and there's already some dissatisfaction on the left um, with the Biden administration and the way that they have um, addressed the, the deportation issue. So that's kind of, I think we're gonna see a lot of piecemeal action from the presidency out of the executive branch, out of Congress, um, much slower, much less responsive, and then whatever can happen at the state and local level. Excellent, thank you. I guess probably the, the COVID relief bill is probably our first example of, of governance in action. Seth, are there any lessons from there that we think the Democrats can draw about how they've approached it, what's what's worked, what what perhaps is not so successful? Um, I mean, so far their coalition seems to have held together on that. Um, it's 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 kind of interesting. And again, I'm just been you know reading a few of the you know the tea leaves and hints on this, but like you know looking at uh, Joe Manchin's behavior in the Senate, um, he has mostly seemed to be on board with this with this fairly. Uh, fairly large, you know, we're, we're talking about like $1.9 trillion uh, COVID relief package. Um, he's also made a couple of, you know, symbolic uh, moves against Democrats. I, you know, most, most notably, you know, to, to uh, refuse to support Neera Tandon uh, for a cabinet position. Um, and that, you know, made some people in the Democratic coalition very angry. But if that's what he has to do to signal to the voters back home that he's with them while also voting for this massive COVID relief package, you know, that some will probably see that as maybe worthwhile. It's also like, this is a pretty popular public policy thing. Um, you know, despite what, uh, you know, sort of longstanding Republican messaging is on on spending and, and deficits and things like that, um, people, you know, most voters seem to be wildly enthusiastic about the idea of just sort of large scale benefits um uh you know just basically you just payouts for for this this past year and to just you know sort of get them through uh, some of the some of the economic challenges right now um one of the areas where i think this has been um where i feel like it's sort of the learning from loss frame but like uh where biden seems to be learning from some of the possible failures of the obama administration a decade ago um is that you know obama came into office in a somewhat similar circumstance and that there there was also like a very severe recession going on and they were talking about getting economic relief to equip people as quickly as possible obama made some uh, some significant overtures to republicans at that time and sought a lot of concessions and was willing to sort of accept a smaller amount of relief for the veneer of bipartisanship he, he felt that was a that was a, a value worth pushing um and i think the sort of the general belief among a lot of democrats coming out of that that that, that was probably not worth the price um that you don't really get that many bonus points for doing things that are bipartisan um if the economy is actually not as strong as it could be um that it probably hurt the party in the 2010 midterm elections and uh, so i think uh Biden's and the Democrats' general approach has been to uh, see, you know, maybe make a few overtures, but basically say we can do this without Republicans, and we don't see any value to, um, you know, to reducing the size of the help we offer voters if it gets one or two Republicans on board um, when we can pass things without them, at least in a narrow set of circumstances, which this COVID relief seems to qualify for that. Really. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I think I said most of what I what I had to say. I've been thinking a lot about the Tandon situation, um, and 
the fact that it looks like she's likely not going to get confirmed as as director of office of management and budget i want to point out the the kind of i'm just gonna go off on that i think um because i'm sort of seeing some kinds of questions on twitter which is during the pandemic my main way of interacting with the world um <laughs> about you know why why this emphasis on OMB and there's like left Twitter was very unhappy with the with the Tandon pick. But I think that and I think that it would be easy to extrapolate from that that this that her not getting confirmed as OMB director, if that ends up happening, that this is a sort of victory for the progressive wing of the party in some way. And I think that that's not that's not true. And you know, thinking back again to kind of Obama's economic team. Obama pulled a lot of people from the Bill Clinton years, and he took a lot of really conservative economic advice in 2009 when they were thinking about the, the stimulus during the, the economic crisis then. He was listening to, to Rahm Emanuel. He was listening to Larry Summers. And so that's, um, I think that's a really kind of critical difference so far between the two administrations is that Biden has seen, so not as far left, right? He's like, he didn't nominate Bernie Sanders for OMB director, but but he did nominate someone who, although she has clearly run afoul of kind of online, the online left, someone who has been leading a progressive think tank and has these kind of progressive connections, but also is deeply connected to the DC establishment that is necessary to get anything done. My guess, I do not know why Biden picked Tandon. It is odd, in my opinion, to pick someone for, for such a position who was so online mm -hmm. and who has clearly too many mean tweets so i'm also never going to be omb director <laughs> fyi but um the you know that so the, i found that very odd but then i thought about it some more and i talked to folks who kind of work in the think tank world and they said the thing about tandon is very she understands progressive priorities and she's really plugged into this the getting it done world um i am assuming that she seemed like the best person to be able to bridge those two sets of priorities and that it will be difficult to find someone else and that it's likely that particularly since since mansion is a sort of big defection so it's going to be a move to the center that we're going to get someone in kind of the more larry summers camp after that so this is potentially a big um this is just a prediction maybe i'm wrong maybe there's a, a reasonable ideological substitute but my guess is that this is a a fairly big kind of attempt to move left on those issues and OMB is hugely important for the White House White House policy making on a whole range of issues um, and that this means that they're going to actually tax center um, going forward because because of these political considerations. Julia at some point we should probably talk about Neera Tandon specifically just like it's, she seems to be this really unusual figure on the Democratic side and that like whichever Democratic faction you're in, you always think Neera Tandon's in the other one. Um, mm -hmm. like, every, like everyone's convinced she's working for someone else. And I, I don't know why she's so polarizing. Obviously, yeah, she's a very online person. Um, mm -hmm. But everyone thinks that, you know, when she does well, it's a sop to the other side. And I don't know, I don't know exactly why that specifically. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I mean, I think some of it, it's, I, I feel like you're teeing me up to say she's a woman of color and okay, as a yeah, result, maybe, people yeah. <laughs> are, people are really negative about her, but I think that that's true. Um, I also think that there, she's sort of caught in the midst of, of the nexus of, and uh, you know, this is another thing I've kind of written about, about ideology versus this outsider establishment dimension where kind of ideologically, as I said, she is someone who really would pull the policy further to the left than anyone we saw in the Obama years, anyone we saw in the Bill Clinton years. Um, and yet, but she is very insidery and the anti-establishment wing of, I wouldn't even call them necessarily the Democratic Party, but the left does not like her. I mean, and some of that is idiosyncratic to this, you know, fight she had with Matt Bruning in like 2016, maybe. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I think some of it is is it's sort of linked to those two factors. So it's like some idiosyncrasy and some being exactly the wrong nexus of establishment outsider and left right. Right, and also related to like whatever people think the Center for American Progress is, which is something like the Hillary Clinton wing of the of the Democratic yeah. Party, but not precisely. So yeah. Yeah, and well, and clearly it's it's. I mean, I I want to be really fair here. <laughs> 
I think it sounds like there were some very serious kind of personnel type issues that happened there that can happen in any large organization. So I sort of put that into the establishment, the establishment sort of direction. And maybe she wasn't good in that role. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm not an insider to that institution. I don't know anyone who is. Excellent. Thank you. We've got a question from Rob Liebman, now one at Professor here. How might last year's upsurge of Black Lives Matter protests affect the Democratic Party? Race is increasingly one of the key lines of division between the parties. Will the possibility of a new reckoning with racism help or hurt the Democrats? Um, yeah. Well, Seth, oh, Julia, whichever, whoever would like to take it. I'll, I'll jump in on this. I mean, I pro probably a lot of what I know about this is from reading Rob's work. So <laughs> um, I'll just repeat it back to you. But um, <laughs> I think that, I think I, beyond the kind of obvious answers about the potential for, um, for kind of going, I don't want to say going too far, but for taking these issues to an extent that then becomes nationally unpopular, I think that's that's fairly obvious. And the less obvious thing for the Democratic Party is the fissure, the kind of young, the way young and old and race interact within the party. Um, and where I particularly see it an emerging division between older and younger black activists in the Democratic Party, where that was the older group was a kind of Biden constituency. And the younger group, I think, maybe sees some of these issues more holistically also, and sees a kind of racial justice agenda as being linked to a more economically left agenda, um, and see and has a very different approach to politics. And so I think that what it does for the, the Democratic Party internally is it, it makes the coalitional politics and those divisions more complicated. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this this really gets at a dilemma that Democrats have been struggling with for you know at least half a century. Um, I was just rereading uh, Hunter Thompson's Fear and Loathing on the 1972 campaign, um, which I was surprised how much I was really just enjoying reading. Um, and one of the things in there is there's like a lot of, you know, in, in the final chapters, there's a lot of, you know, George McGovern and other Democrats talking about why they thought they lost. And they're sort of wrestling with, we didn't give black people enough to vote for, you know, we were not inspiring. And also, um, you know, we could have addressed the needs of those white racists um, and brought them back to our fold if we did sort of address their, their economic anxiety. And with just a few name changes, you could have had the exact same conversation today or the exact same conversation after 2016. Um, and so, I, you know, I don't see that tension within the Democratic Party going away anytime soon. It's still going to be, um, how do we address the concerns of economically anxious whites? You know, how do we also, you know, acknowledge the concerns of, of people of color, of women, you know, of others who, uh, you know, whose identities we have been championing. Um, but if we push too far, we feel like it's making us uncompetitive. They're still struggling with that. What I think the the Black Lives Matter protests um, and the, the movement in general has done is it, it's it's just moved the balance a little more toward um, toward one side of that conversation and toward uh, just saying, um, you know, we that a lot of people in the party are simply not going to go quietly back to a time when they're willing to just you know, to just sort of let the party do well without them. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're saying, look, th our identity um, is really important. And it's a major part of what we are as a party. And, uh, you know, we're seeing this at a time when women and people of color are becoming just numerically a much larger percentage of the Democratic Party and particularly of Democratic activists and the people who are involved in, in primaries and caucuses. And I think they're, they're just less willing to just accept the argument that they need to be quiet so the party can win. Um, and so it's, you know, I, I, I think that's probably healthy for the party going forward, but it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, that's, I think, probably the legacy of last summer. Julia, do you have anything? Would you like to add anything to that? No. Unfortunately, that brings us to the top of the hour. I think I'd probably speak for everyone here, and I'd love this conversation to keep going for another couple of hours. I think this is a really, been a really fascinating discussions and really, really great insights from both our panelists. So wherever you may be in the world, please put your hands together. <laughs> Julia Zari and Seth Maskett, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Please do go to the RAI website to see our future events, including more in the future American politics. And yes, just finally again, thank you very much to both of our guests. That was wonderful. Thank you Thanks for much. having us on. Pleasure.